Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Bob Gamport. He's the Keurig Dr. Pepper CEO. Welcome to the show, Bob. Coffee Hi, is, a, is a big question and obviously a, a big growth driver for you. What do you expect is going to happen as people go back to the office more? Yeah, well, over the past year, as we saw mobility decrease, obviously people went from working in the office to working at home. And so we saw really a shift in where coffee com consumption was occurring. Uh, so we saw a pickup in our at-home business, but we saw a loss in our away-from-home business. So this was a challenge for us to navigate the strength in one area to offset the weakness in another. But from a bigger picture standpoint, if you go back over the past five years, we've added uh, 12 million new households to the Keurig system. We've gone from 21 to 33. So the short-term impact was nice, but really the long-term impact has been consistent. What's happened with the rest of your business, specifically carbonated soft drinks, CSDs, as people have stayed home away from convenience stores and fast food restaurants? Are, are they buying more of that at home? What's going on there? Yeah, so what got hurt the most would be our on-premise business, fountain and food service, as we call it, which is restaurants and hospitality. Uh, we sold the impulse channel. So people would pick up a drink, you know, and then the gas station on the way to and from work, obviously that dropped as well. But we did see a nice pickup in large outlet stores with take home packs. And we saw a real surge in e-commerce. And we believe we're the most developed food and beverage company in e-commerce. And so again, you're seeing this mixed challenge that we had to navigate where we had to offset the issues in one channel with growth in another. But our execution in 2020 was spectacular. We gained share on 90% of our cold portfolio. So that also helped offset the challenges that we faced. Bob, I wanted to go back to coffee, if I may, and, and ask uh, whether you think people will uh, make more coffee at home long term, even when we go back to normal. I mean, we've all saved money by eating and drinking at home more than, than going out. Coffee feels like something that one could just keep doing uh, and, and take to work rather than necessarily buy in coffee shops. And, and uh, linked to that, do you think people are drinking more coffee in total and that will persist also? We That's a very interesting question. Total coffee consumption has remained uh, at about the same level pre-pandemic, but that's been growing nicely every year. But what we saw was a dramatic shift in where people consume coffee. And to your point, they're making it home at a much higher frequency than they did before. They've had a really good experience with it. We sold 11 million Keurig brewers last year. So that's a combination of 3 million new households entering the system and an unprecedented level of people upgrading their brewers because they were really shifting to a work from home mode. And so the experience that they've had with Keurig over the past year, which is the quality of the machines is better, the uh, experience with the coffee is significantly higher, I think allowed them to rediscover not only the convenience and the value that comes from making coffee at home, but also the quality being significantly higher than they may have recalled in the past. Wilfred's way of telling me he's not going to bring me Starbucks anymore before the show when we when we get back together, yeah. which was a tradition. Bob, what about the structure? It's been so complex since your since your deal with the JAB holdings, the Mondelez stake, the lockups. How much of it is available for public float at this point? And can you qualify at this point to join the S&P 500? You're one of the biggest companies not in it. Yeah, it's been quite a journey for us. So my journey with with KDP starts with the take private of Keurig Green Mountain. And so we were 100% private. We merged with Dr. Pepper Snapple and only 13% of our shares were available to the public. Well, today that number is north of 50%. And uh, that, that volatility that you described along the way, I think has been greatly simplified. We have an anchor shareholder now in JV who plans to stay for the long term with plenty of liquidity and plenty of shares available to uh, public shareholders with a real high quality base. We're the most valuable company right now that's not in the S&P 500. You saw that last year we moved over to NASDAQ and we're in the NASDAQ 100, but we'd still like to be in the S&P 500 and we think that's coming. Well, we, we can see lots of the brands behind you. We've got a, a wall of them uh, here as well. Are there any uh, areas that you're, you're not operating in at all that, that you're looking to, some of the new hot areas, whether it's uh, alcohol-involved uh, drinks, hard seltzers, or, or CBD-based drinks, that sort of thing? Yeah, when we launched this new company, we were the first to put hot and cold beverages together at scale. And we describe ourselves as a modern beverage company because we look at beverages 
holistically. We look at, look at it from a consumer need standpoint rather than a traditional format segmentation of the industry, which led us to this insight about coffee and cold beverages. That's our mindset going forward. And so we're not in a position to talk about anything beyond that, but we have clearly mapped out the open territory in our portfolio. We know where the consumer is going. And through a combination of organic development, partnerships and M&A, we'll continue to expand our reach into, uh, into new areas of beverage. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.